Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer on the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your genes. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Claire Hooker completes part two of the story of radio astronomy pioneer Ruby Payne Scott. But first up, here's the news about the proposed new Australian Space Agency. Space Agency for Australia? Last year, the Australian Federal Government funded a review of Australia's legislation on space, with a view to modernising the law to make it easier for Australia's space industry to thrive. I interviewed the author of the review, Professor Stephen Freeland, in December last year for Diffusion. He was expecting the government to release the report any day. But it's almost a year later, and they've failed to release it. In July 2017, the Australian government announced that it was funding a new review of space legislation that would be due to report in March 2018. The new review would be undertaken by an expert reference group staffed by people from industry, chaired by the former head of CSIRO, Megan Clark, and which includes Professor Freeland. One of the items the panel will report on in March 2018 will be whether Australia should have its own space agency, amongst other possible options for helping space businesses. The expert reference group met for the first time in mid-September. Barely a week later, almost exactly like a scene out of ABC Television's satirical current affairs comedy Utopia, on Monday 25th September, Senator Michaelia Cash Acting Minister for Industry and Science, ahead of her keynote talk at the International Astronautics Conference being held in Adelaide, that the government was announcing the establishment of an Australian space agency. Whoops. What is the point of setting up an expert reference group if you're going to announce policy before they've had the chance to report? They've virtually only had one meeting. Instead of Senator Cash's announcement, News services instead ran the Australian Space Agency story using the voice of Senator Simon Birmingham, Minister for Education and a Senator for South Australia, as he suggested that it was likely that South Australia would host the new space agency, and hence get the new jobs. I was unable to find any news service that featured a recording of Senator Cash's announcement, and her office was unable to help. Instead, I'll have to read from Michaelia Cash's press release. The global space industry is growing rapidly, and it's crucial that Australia is part of this growth. A national space agency will ensure that we have a strategic long-term plan that supports the development and application of space technologies and grows our domestic space industry. The agency will be the anchor for our domestic coordination and the front door for our international engagement. An anchor and a front door. Well, that's the space biz. The government have been very vague about what the space agency might actually do. And the budget for the proposed space agency won't be revealed until the federal budget is released in 2018. This hasn't stopped the haters on Twitter from complaining that the Australian space agency costs too much. Left of Labour wrote, So now the Liberals can afford a space agency but can't afford welfare, health and education. Even NASA has seen funding cuts. Walter Slurry wrote, Turnbull to invest in a space agency, but not Aboriginal health, affordable housing, welfare, NDIS, renewables, refugees, dental, dot dot dot. Senator Birmingham has assured people that an Australian space agency won't explore space, 
or send people into space, but help bring space businesses to Australia to create local jobs. Somehow, space entrepreneurs in Australia have had a hard time with the current legislation and the cost of compliance. Just a few weeks ago, the government announced that they're cutting another 57 jobs from the Commonwealth Science and Industrial Research Organisation, the CSIRO. Specifically, the scientists and engineers losing their jobs are working at the CSIRO Division of Astronomy and Space Science in Marsfield. The one that I visited recently for diffusion. Space scientists are being fired and the lab that invented Wi-Fi and new superfast communications technologies is being closed down. CSIRO has lost one-fifth of its workforce since the Liberal National Party was elected in 2013. That's twice as bad as being decimated. There are no other Australian employers for these scientists. I first saw a space agency for Australia as Science Party policy. Shadow Science Minister Kim Carr announced the Australian Labor Party also has a policy for an Australian space agency at the International Astronautics Conference. A lot of people on social media have expressed delight at the idea of a space agency, but horror at the idea that it will be run by the government responsible for politicising and ruining the national broadband network by substituting plans for new optic fibres with 30-year-old copper coaxial cables to save money. This is also the government responsible for the compulsory online census that crashed when people used it, the tax office computer backup failure, the social security robo-debt disaster of 20,000 fake debts issued to people on welfare every week, censoring our internet and spying on our browsing history. Let's not forget bringing coal into parliament and denying climate change is caused by humans. This government, they point out, hate science and is bad with computers. Osmosis posted, to boldly hoon where no bogan has hooned before, Australian Space Agency motto. Lord Wentworth wrote, NBN Co. to run Space Agency with a remit to develop partially hyperfast rocket to the node technology. Paul Kidd wrote, I would be so excited about the Space Agency if I had the faintest glimmer of confidence in our government actually delivering it. John Wren wrote, Breaking! New Australian Space Agency to be entirely manned by unemployed, debt-laden university graduates on $4 an hour internships. Dave Donovan posted, Detailed plan of new Turnbull Space Agency clean coal-powered copper rocket. On Reddit, Boiter posted, I figured they would go with RTTN, rocket to the near-Earth orbit, and then use a fire extinguisher to make the last little bit because it's cheaper. It doesn't sound like this government values space science, so where does this announcement come from? Former Senator John Madigan famously said, Submarines are the spaceships of the ocean. Putting the space agency in Adelaide smells a lot like the $50 billion submarine contract that last year promised to bring 2,800 jobs to Adelaide at a price of more than $17 million per job. Despite the fact that that a French nuclear submarine company was contracted to actually build the submarines instead of the government-owned Australian Submarine Corporation. What's the point of having your own submarine corporation if they don't build your submarines? These lucrative jobs are now in doubt that the French company has decided not to employ anyone in Australia. The government needs South Australia to be seen to be getting more jobs since the government kicked all the car manufacturers out of South Australia immediately after being elected in 2013. It sounds like the government is already politicising the space agency by hinting it will bring jobs and money to a region where it needs votes. Currently, the plan is to have a plan. And they've hired the people to come up with that plan, but after meeting for the first time only a few weeks ago, the government is already making announcements about space jobs for South Australia. Chris Duckett, writing for ZNet, says that the space agency smells not of rocket fuel, but of pork. Pigs in space! (laughs) 
You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Next up, the second and final chapter of the story of pioneer of radio astronomy, Ruby Payne Scott. Claire Hooker is Senior Lecturer in Health and Medical Humanities at Sydney Health Ethics in the School of Public Health at the University of Sydney. She has an interest in the history of women in science, technology, engineering and maths. Last week we were talking about Ruby's early life. I continued the conversation by asking her, how did Ruby Payne Scott continue her career? She remained at the CSIR, yep. So she continued to work for the next six years as one of the team that were formative in that very, very early period of radio astronomy. And one of her biggest achievements, looking back, is that in the research group, she was regarded, I believe, as the best mathematician out of anybody in the research group. And indeed, when others had difficulty with their mathematical calculations, they would come to her. It's one of her great sources of authority. And again, this is the day before computers. So making calculations was a lengthy time-consuming and very inexact task and you had to be very careful to get all these things correct. But Ruby wrote the paper with Joe Pawsey and we have tried to reconstruct well, I think I think science is a collaborative process anyway, so I don't think it serves us well to pretend that some individual is the person who is an originary moment. But we were trying to think about what it was that led them to this inside. But Ruby and Joe were the people who identified the firm mathematical foundation for the research that would then take place, which is that you could make calculations about these radio sources that they were identifying using Fourier transforms. And that became as I say, the basis for how you would go about making calculations in radio astronomy thereafter. But one of the great limitations for radio astronomy in those age, in that age is that you, you really need a computer. It, it doesn't take you very much time to develop the need for a calculation that would take a human being <laughs> months, literally, which a computer can now do for us, of course, virtually, instantaneously. But that slowed people down an enormous amount. So that, that was very impressive work. And then she continued to make solar observations, further attempting to classify these different types and to try and start to work out their temperatures, what was happening to create these emissions and so on, how we would understand this sunspot activity. And she was only able to do that for another six years. She was only able to do that for another six years. So what actually happened was that she became pregnant. And in fact, she had a miscarriage. In After four or five years, she had a miscarriage. And then when she became pregnant again, we all presume that she was quite anxious to ensure the health and safety of this pregnancy. And so she resigned at that point and left the CSIR, which uh, which had become the CSIRO. And she, although I think the research team made it very clear to her that she would be very welcome to return, for whatever reasons she did not return to employment in CSIRO. It's my understanding that she had to get married secretly because of legislation. Well, it's that's true and not quite true. So amongst her research team, her marriage was not a secret. And in fact, Paul Wilde, who was one of the founding radio astronomers of that period, recalls that one Friday afternoon, Ruby said, I'm going to leave work early, Paul, because Bill and I are going off to the registry office and we're going to get married. But whilst her colleagues were understanding about that, Ruby, like every other woman who was employed by the government, which includes nurses, school teachers, were subject to a rule that required that women resign upon their marriage and that they were not able to receive full-time employment. And clearly she did not resign and she remained in 
employment. So she was violating that particular rule. Exceptions could be made, but normally you had to go through official channels to find the exceptions. And I know that there was one leading member of the CSIRO scientific team who was quite a pursuer of the marriage bar, like really tried to enforce it. There's no evidence that he had any effect. He was in biology. There's no evidence that he had any effect on Ruby or her research team, but his presence is indicative of the fact that this was a real issue for women to face at that time. And we do know that when the CSIR reformed as the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, or CSIRO, what we know today, was a significant restructure. And during it, somebody identified that Ruby was married and should not be entitled to either her position or to her benefits, and with so superannuation and so on that accompanied them. And she had already had to fight after World War II to retain her position at her salary because after World War II ended, many women employees of CSIR were, well, they tried to require that women who had been employed during the war in a full-time wage drop back to the normal two-thirds wage that were normally applied to women. And Ruby was one of those who was quite angry and upset. And she was not somebody to suffer fools gladly. (laughs) So she made her feelings known. So her marriage was known to her colleagues who were clearly supportive of her and I think largely would have found the formal conditions surrounding women's employment unacceptable, though not all of them or few of them, I think, have said so formally. But when it reached formal channels, she had to fight for her position and her pay and indeed she lost her superannuation. She lost her benefits at that point in time. So her marriage was, as it were, an institutional secret, but not a secret amongst her colleagues. But it was not her marriage, but her but pregnancy and motherhood that became the big issue that prevented her from continuing in in research, despite her being sort of admired as the finest physicist among that group. And was she able to contribute or was motherhood her main concern after that point she became she returned to school teaching actually her two children were impressive one became a internationally renowned professor of applied statistics professor peter hall who sadly died only about a year ago and the other is artist uh, fiona hall who is extremely well known has just had a wonderful represented australia at the venice biennale So she spent some time in parenthood and doing hands-on things like renovating their house and so on. And she was a very avid bushwalker too, so I'm sure they had lots of sort of practical outside time. But then she did go go back into school teaching. Ruby was an enjoyable character. So I've done some research about women's experiences in Australian science, concentrating on that generation of women who did their degrees in the first half of the 20th century. And most of them were people who were clear thinkers, but who largely concentrated on their sense of privilege, that science was an, an area to them where actually sexism was minimised, where what mattered was your work and not what your sex was. And they brushed aside equal pay as um, something that didn't affect their self-concept, that as long as their colleagues admired their research, which they did, that they felt science was actually quite a welcoming space. But there are also women who were, um, as scientists often are, I think, reasonably self-effacing, fairly collegial in their interactions. But Ruby was a very out loud, (laughs) courageous, campaigning sort of character, not at all like most um, women scientists were. She was a a genuine card-carrying member of the Communist Party, has a large ASIO file, had large strident political arguments at work, and most of radio physics was fairly left-wing, but, you know, Ruby really wanted to force people to the wall where their political colours were concerned. She got into trouble from the conservative librarian for wearing shorts to work, which was considered unfeminine, and she was extremely capable with tools and, and an avid bushwalker exploring in the Blue Mountains. So she's a very... 
likable and larger than life kind of person. And it has become since, thanks mostly to the endeavours of Professor Miller Goss, who's published two full biographies of her, and that numerous um, articles have now been written about her. So she's now become a little bit, as she should be, of a, a symbol and a representation of the kind of chutzpah and courage that women as scientists could and should aspire to have. Not only fabulously capable, but there are now fellowship and uh, career development awards that are named in her honour. I can perhaps illustrate the regard in which she's held with a small vignette that there was once a visiting group of researchers, one of whom read a paper to the research team. And Ruby said, can you tell me where you got this particular number, this particular result on which the rest of your argument is based? And he said, well, it was from this one astronomer. I can't remember who it was, but I think I'm a member of the research team. And Ruby said, well, it's wrong. And he stood up and tore his paper up. And he, he said, no one questioned Ruby. They knew she would be right. <laughs> she said it was wrong. There went the argument. <laughs> it was all over Red Rover. In terms of fabulous female role models, Ruby is definitely one for young girls to celebrate and enjoy. Well, Claire Hooker, thank you very much. Thank you. That was Dr. Claire Hooker, Senior Lecturer in Health and Medical Humanities at Sydney Health Ethics in the School of Public Health at the University of Sydney. Next week, time capsules on the moon. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your own voice on radio? Record a voice memo on your phone or use the voicemail tab on the website. We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Join my patrons in supporting the show at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 27 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2NVR in Nambucca Valley, and 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 900 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords, so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.